All right, so today we're going to continue on with the Mendelian genetics. I'm just going to recap some of the things that we went over yesterday, uh, just so you can have a taste of what, uh, what we talked about yesterday. So bear with me for this, and then we'll get to the new stuff, and I'll slow down a little bit. So we said our objectives are to explain the significance of Mendel's experiments to the study of genetics. Once again, laying the foundation of genetics as we know it today. Then summarize the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. Predict the possible offspring from a cross using a Punnett square, which you guys have already done. Main idea, Mendel explained how a dominant allele can mask the presence of a recessive allele. So a dominant allele, I like a capital letter, what we use those things for, to mask the presence of a recessive allele, a lowercase letter. Okay, we'll talk more about that uh, as we go. So, quick vocab, we said once again, if we see a P, we're talking about the parent generation. We see an F1, the first generation produced by the parents. The F2 are the offspring of the F1 generation. An allele, on the other hand, is an alternate form of a gene. So, once again, eye color, for example. Eye color, you can have uh, brown eyes, green eyes, and blue eyes. So once again, the father of genetics is Gregor Mendel. He was an Austrian monk, not a Tibetan monk that many of us thought, uh, a, a Catholic monk. And he did his work, once again, studying pea plants in order to earn his degree as a teacher. And that's, once again, what he looks like, not the Tibetan monk. We said genetics is the science of heredity. Heredity is how traits are passed from one generation to the next. So how you got your traits from your uh, mom and dad and how you will pass on traits to your children one day and so forth and so forth down the line. Well, what did he do? Well, once again, he crossed purebred yellow plants and purebred green plants. So what was he looking at? The seeds. So the seeds were yellow uh, for one purebred plant and the other ones were green. So when he crossed him, he anticipated a 50-50 mix, but instead he got 100% yellow, which once again perplexed him because he thought he would at least have some green in there. So we're looking at the F1 generation and the P generation. So what he did is he allowed the uh, yellow P plants, or the yellow uh, plants that produce yellow seeds, to self-pollinate, and he saw in the F2 generation a 3 to 1 ratio, about 6,000 yellow and about 2,000 green. Okay, and 2,000 from a grand total of 8,000 seeds is about 25%. So he anticipated there must have been something else at play here, which ultimately led him to believe there were two traits, that a individual contains two traits, not one, like many people thought. So supporting the theory that you get half your information from mom and half from dad to make you a whole. Now, what traits show up, once again, is whether they're dominant or recessive. So in his F2 generation, he saw a 3 to 1 ratio, as you can see here on the screen. This is where we left off, so get ready to take some notes after this slide. If you haven't copied the slide down, go ahead and do so. Different traits are known as alleles, and we said alleles are any alternative form of a single gene. In this case, we had an alternate form of seed color, green and yellow. Now, look at the chromosome uh, on the, in the picture provided. You notice that a chromosome can have many different alleles on them, or genes. So, what is on, say, the top one here, maybe this is mom's chromosome that she gave you, and the bottom one is dad's chromosome that he gave you, you can have different alleles, right? So, the traits overall can vary in individuals. So, once again, we use Chris as an example. He talked about how he has blue eyes but yet his dad has brown eyes. His dad has a different trait um, on his other chromosome, which was stood for the blue eyes, and therefore that's how Chris got his blue eyes, his sister got brown eyes, and also his brother got blue eyes as well. So in this case, they're looking at an allele for purple flowers and an allele for white flowers. So notice, this individual has two chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, but inherited two different traits, right? One purple, one white. How are alleles represented on paper, right? We have our representation in Congress, but how do we represent these alleles on paper so we can understand them? You've already got a taste of this when you guys performed uh, the monohybrid cross, right? We use letters, capital letters, in equal the dominant alleles, and the lowercase letters equal the recessive alleles. 
So for example, we used yellow, which was a dominant uh, seed trait, and we used green as the recessive. So therefore, on yellow, we're going to choose a letter Y. So we're going to give it a big Y. Green, we're going to stick with the consistency of Y and use the lowercase y. Now some of you might be asking, hey, could we just use a big Y for yellow and a little g for green? That is a possibility. However, when we start talking about dihybrid crosses, it becomes a little more difficult. Because if you have two different letters for the same trait, and you're talking about multiple traits, then it can get rather confusing. This is why we stick with the same letter no matter what, okay, for the allele or trait we're looking at, okay? Now, <clears throat> dominant versus recessive, okay? Dominant, the trait that is observed or hides the recessive trait. The recessive trait, on the other hand, is uh, the trait that is hidden or masked by the dominant allele. So, focus first on the picture on the lower left, the trees. So I want you to imagine, just close your eyes and think about this. You are standing in a field, a field of grass. You have long rolling hills, and there is no trees in sight except for one big tree in the far distance. You can see it. It's huge, right? And you're already far away. So you decide to start walking closer to this tree. And as you go mile by mile, you, the tree becomes larger and larger until finally you are toe-to-toe -to -toe with this tree, looking up at this massive tree, and you see it. And then you lean around the tree, and you see something else. You see a small little tree there. Now, the small little tree did not grow in the time frame it took you to walk there, and if it did, my goodness, you should be dead by now. But anyways, the tree has been there the whole time, right? But you never saw it. All you ever saw was the big tree. This is how dominant versus recessive alleles work. They're there, you just don't see them because the dominant alleles overshadow them. Doesn't mean that they don't exist or you don't have them. They are there, they're just not seen as easily. Okay? You have to look at the actual DNA code to find them. Alright? Now, just like in the picture on the right, if they were gladiator warriors duking out and you're on the battlefield, just like you see here, yes, the dominant one should win, right? And that's going to overpower the recessive trait. But I love this picture because it is a picture of David versus Goliath. Because we are going to find out later, when we talk about complex patterns of inheritance, that sometimes that recessive allele is not so recessive. So I'll leave you on the cliffhanger for that so we can talk about it next time. Alright, two traits per plant or per individual. We've already established that. Each plant contains two copies of a particular gene, half from each parent. Possible genotypes that you could receive or you may possess for a particular trait. You may possess both dominant alleles, such as this case for seed color, which they would both have uh, the dominant allele for yellow. And you would call them homozygous dominant. Okay. Now, in science, the word homo actually means the same. So, the way I read this when I see homozygous dominant I read it as same big letters, because dominant to, mean, dominant to me means big letters. So homozygous, same big letters. If you had two little y's, or the both recessive alleles, you still had the same type of alleles, they're both recessive, so homo meaning the same, recessive meaning small, so same small letters, homozygous recessive, same small letters. However, if you have big Y, little y, you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, therefore, you are heterozygous. If homo means the same, hetero must mean different. So, there's a little science terminology for you. And we use these words quite a bit, homozygous um, and heterozygous quite a bit. So, make sure you do know the meanings behind homozygous and heterozygous. All right? So we're going to apply some of this knowledge to now some Punnett squares. Let's see what you can do here. So homozygous versus heterozygous. Homozygous, uh, organism with two of the same alleles for a specific trait, big Y, big Y, or, big, or little Y, little Y. And you are therefore classified as purebred. So if anybody has, uh, for example, blue eyes, you possess the both recessive alleles. And therefore you are purebred. 
for Akala. So, pretty awesome, right? Brown eyes gets a little more trickier because if you exhibit the dominant trait, you may have a recessive trait that's not seen. So, we don't know if you are actually purebred brown eyes yet. So, blue eye people though, you're purebred for blue eyes. Awesome. Heterozygous, on the other hand, organisms with two different alleles for a specific trait, right? So you could be big Y and little y. An organism that is heterozygous for a specific trait is also called a hybrid because you have both the dominant and recessive. Sometimes they're also called carriers, carriers for a specific trait. And this is usually a term that we use when we talk about carriers for genetic disorders, that you could be carrying a genetic disorder even though you don't exhibit exhibit it yourself but you may be carrying the trait and could pass it on to your children which is valuable information to know if you ever plan on having children one day all right so on the worksheet that i gave you last time you noticed there was something called a genotype and a phenotype so here's a little explanation of what that means so a genotype is an organism's allele pairs so what do you actually possess for genes Right? You could be big Y, big Y, big Y, little Y, or little Y, little Y. Right? Just depends. So it's the actual genetic makeup of the individual. How do I remember this? Geno. Geno sounds like gene. So the actual genes possessed within you. Okay? Phenotype, on the other hand, is the observable characteristics that are expressed as a result of your genetic makeup or allele pair. Okay? So actual physical features like yellow or green. How do I remember phenotype? I remember it is the physical appearance. Physical begins with the letter P. Phenotype begins with the letter P. So phenotype, physical appearance. Okay? So if you can keep those straight, you are as good as gold. So alleles and gametes. So now we know what allele is and we know what a gamete is. A gamete is a egg or sperm cell. So how do alleles and gametes, how do these things work out? Well, let's take a look. The law of segregation. Segregate means to separate, basically. Two alleles for each trait separate during meiosis. So you, for example, right? You have traits that come from mom and dad. So you have a, a chromosome from mom and one from dad that have possibly two different traits or alleles on there. Okay, those chromosomes will separate out into different egg or sperm cells. All right, so this is the formation of gametes dividing the genetic information, so half from each parent. So here we go. If you were homozygous dominant, let's say for um, eye color, brown. So if you're homozygous dominant and you have a brown eye allele from mom and a brown eye allele from dad, and when you make egg or sperm cells, all of your egg or sperm cells are going to have the brown eye allele because that's the only thing you can donate, right? That's it. If you are homozygous recessive, like, for example, little y, little y, the only thing you can donate in your egg or sperm cells, all of them, is going to be the recessive allele. That's it. So, going back to Chris, for example, you got blue eyes, Chris. So, you are recessive or purebred, so that means you are homozygous recessive for eye color. Therefore, the only allele you can donate to your kids is going to be the blue eye allele. Okay? Now, it gets trickier if you are heterozygous, though, because that means you have a 50% chance of your gametes being or possessing the dominant allele and 50% chance of them possessing the recessive allele in your egg or sperm cells. And that's where the variation comes into play. So for some of you outliers where you look at your parents and go, I don't have the same eye color as them, don't worry. You're not the milkman's kid, all right? It means that your parents are probably heterozygous and carrying a recessive trait, and that made you, okay? So don't freak out, all right? So a little genetics for you there. Now, alleles and gametes, Mendel's experiments. So once again, this is showing you uh, an overflow of what he did. So we got our P generation over here, right? So P generation, the yellow and the green. Once again, we cross these, okay? And then 
we ended up with, once again, we had our dominant allele, dominant allele, recessive allele, recessive allele. We crossed those two individuals. They made look of this, a zygote. Remember that terminology there? Yeah, when an egg and sperm cell fuse together, it makes a zygote. And then this made the F1 generation all hybrids for the uh, seed color. So they were big Y, little y, as it says right here. Okay? Or, yeah, big Y, little y. So when he crossed them again, ultimately he got a 3 to 1 ratio. So that explains everything we need to know about what he did in his experiment, applying some terminology there. So here it is once again. You can see from the illustration, uh, the F1 generation was crossed to make the F2 generation. And once again, if we worked a uh, Punnett square, we would derive the same results that we see here on the bottom. But I do want to draw your attention down here to the phenotype and the genotype. Some of you might have been wondering, hey, how do I figure this out? What you do is you count up the number of individuals that have the same type of allele pair, okay? Or the physical appearance, depending on what you're doing. So let's focus in on genotype first, okay? Right here, genotype, the bottom one. We need to go through and we need to look at this first one, this first one right here, all right? Number one, how many of them have or are homozygous dominant? We look at uh, two, three, and four, and we find that none of them only one of them are homozygous dominant. So we put one, big Y, big Y, all right? Then we go to the next one. We see number two is big Y, little y. How many of them are that, or heterozygous? We find one, two. So we would put two, big Y, little y, and we then finally find there's a one oddball, uh, homozygous recessive, little y, little y, and we put one, little y, little y. Now, you're thinking, hey, do I have to actually put the big Y, big Y, big Y, little y, and little y, little y? Yes. If you do not, those numbers tell me nothing, nothing at all. So pay close attention to this right now. On your worksheet that you're going to be getting today, on the genotype, if you do not put the numbers with the allele pairs, I will not count them correct. So make sure you have them on there, okay? All right, so now phenotype. We know that we got to figure out, okay, what the alleles stand for. So go through and count how many of them have a dominant allele for the F2 generation. As you go through, you will find that there are three of them that all possess the dominant trait. If you possess the dominant trait, you will exhibit the dominant trait regardless of the other allele. Okay? So if we look at number one, two, and three, we find that they all three have the dominant allele which in this case was yellow. The only one that did not have a dominant allele has both recessive alleles. And the only way to express the recessive trait is if you have both recessive alleles. So we see that one down there. So therefore, there's only one green one. So we make a ratio of the phenotypic physical appearance, phenotype is physical appearance, a 3 to 1 ratio, which is 3 yellow to 1 green. And yes, you must put three yellow to one green. If you do not put the uh, physical appearance with it, I will count it wrong as well. Okay, so make sure you do this on your worksheets. So monohybrid, once again, this is we've gone over it. You've done a worksheet on it, so I think you've got it down for the most part, but I'm still going to uh, go through this one just to make sure you got it. All right, a cross of gametes from each parent, okay? Example, two hybrid individuals, both heterozygous. What would those two, uh, if they combine them together, what potential offspring would they make? So the potential offspring are within this box right here. Does that guarantee they're going to have all those? No, but it's a chance that they could have it, all right? So, what we look at here is we have big Y, big Y, um, uh, big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, and little Y, little Y. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring this one down and this one across, and that's how we do it. So we're going to bring it down, bring it across, bring it down, bring it across. Now once again, if you have the dominant allele, the big dog eats first, it goes first. Bring it down, bring it across. All right. So that's how it works for a mono hybrid cross. Okay, so now, 
a little pop quiz here for you. So what is the genotypic ratio and the phenotypic ratio? Okay, think about this. In genotype, what are the actual genes made up of? Okay, so go through and start in the upper left-hand corner of the box, right up here, and let's count them. Okay, how many of them are big Y, big Y? Well, there's one, no, no, and no. So there's one big Y, big Y. Now, let's take a look at the second box. So start here, go across. How many of them are big Y, little box? Little, big Y, little Y. One, two, two. So two big Y, little Y. Right? And then we go to the last one. How many of them are little Y, little Y? One. So you would write one big Y, big Y to two big Y, little Y to one little Y, little Y. So that would be your genotypic ratio. What is the phenotypic ratio? Once again, phenotype. So let's say this was still yellow versus green. How many of them actually possess the dominant trait of big Y? This box, one, two, three, that's it. So three of them would be yellow. How many of them are going to be green for the phenotypic ratio? One, because there's only one that possesses both recessive alleles. So let's take a step further here. What if 100 seeds were produced? Okay, so we've got this whole thing going down. Same thing that we just did. But now, what if 100 seeds were produced? What would the ratios be now? So take a moment to formulate your guess and think about it. Okay, now let's think about this. Now, each box, one, two, three, four, is about 25%. So, what is 25% of 100? Think about it. Think about it. Some of you are thinking way too hard right now. Yep. Yep, I can see, I can see the steam rolling out. Yep. Okay, so 25 is the answer, okay? So how many of them are going to be homozygous dominant? 25. How many of them are going to be heterozygous? 50. Because that box is 25, that box is 25. How many of them are going to be homozygous recessive? 25. Now, here's the next question. How many of them are going to be yellow? Think about it. 25, 25, 25, because they all have the dominant trait. 75. How many are going to be green? 25. Pretty simple, right?